Hey folks, if you're just signing in, make sure you introduce yourself. We're going to get started right away today. Just getting all my screens sorted out here. All right, guys, welcome to Introduction to Permaculture Part 4. If somebody can do a sound check for me, that'd be much appreciated. Just to make sure that uh, we're getting good sound quality. I don't want to put you guys through um, a bad sound experience like we had on a couple of the early Earth shows there. Hey, Mary Ellen, nice to have you. Hey, Karen, nice to see you on the show. Christine, Philip, Evelyn. Seek to find Kona, Yvonne. Awesome guys, glad that you guys can make it. Um, I'm not gonna waste any time tonight. We're gonna get right into the content. Um, as I mentioned, it's Introduction to Permaculture Part Four. And tonight we're gonna be talking about water harvesting and there's sure to be plenty of additional resources. So hopefully you guys can help out and uh, go and seek some of those resources for me um, and then post them up into the community uh, chat window there uh, as they come up because I'm sure you guys will want to reference them a little bit later. Um, so let's get into it. Welcome and I hope you guys are having a great evening. I know I am. I'm always excited about these introduction um, evenings and I have to say uh, a really warm-hearted thank you. Um, it's a little bit strange for me to pre be presenting on a live platform like YouTube. I don't have a lot of experience with this and I wasn't really too sure what to expect by all of it. Um, but your emails, your, I'm being flooded with emails about this program and it's uh, provided a lot more fulfillment for me than I ever thought possible. Um, and so I just wanted to reach out to all of you guys, you know who you are, um, that have uh, sent me emails, thank yous. Um, some of you have even sent donations. It's been really kind um, and uh, yeah, I, I can't thank you enough. So thank you very much. Um, all right, so if this is your first time uh, joining us, um, Verge Permaculture is really based around this idea that most people are concerned about the fragility of the world, but don't know what to do about it and feel completely alone. Verge Permaculture's education programs and consulting process connects you to a supportive community and teaches you how to take an, take action on an individual level so that we can be stronger together. You know, it's amazing how often people come out of our programs and say, oh my gosh, I found finally found my community. Um, people think that a lot of these for, um, resilience issues or fragilities that they're thinking about, and we talk some, about some of them in this program, but we try and always partner it with optimism and positivity, um, that they're the only ones thinking about it. But truthfully, there's a lot of people thinking about the fragility of the world. And so we really try and help our students to reframe that fragility and to make change in their life so that they don't have to worry about it anymore, basically. And so that's what Verge is all about. Verge was created because I had all of those same emotions inside of me. Um, I remember driving my family crazy about peak oil when I first found out about it when I was in the oil and gas industry. And I had nowhere to put all of my energy. I had nowhere to uh, funnel it into anything that was positive or optimistic. And that was one of the reasons we left our jobs to travel around the world to go and seek solutions. So we collected those solutions and we brought them back. And our job is to guide folks like you um, to see the world through a different set of lenses so that you can start taking action. And truthfully, these massive problems are just symptoms of a bunch of us just not taking responsibility for our own needs. And when you take responsibility for your own needs, not only does your fear and loneliness disappear because you're connected with other people that are doing similar things, 
but the world just naturally gets better. It's all a scale issue. It's like, where do you, are you going to address these problems? And so that was what Verge was founded and started to do. And it's wonderful to have the uh, platform like YouTube and the ability to leverage this knowledge in a way that has never really been available to us. So awesome. Before we go any further, guys, I want to ask you uh, a couple of questions. Feel free to post us up onto social media. Again, as we're going through the program, hit the like button if you're getting a lot of value out of this. And another way that you can help give me some feedback um, and compensate me for this evening, uh, I have a couple of questions that I'd like you to think about. And you can either email me the answers or you can put them into the chat window and I will... Um, um, I'll read them after the program tonight and I'll capture them. So um, first of all, I'm curious how many of you guys are getting value out of these intro courses. Um, and if you're getting value, a yes is great, but even better would be what specifically uh, the biggest value that you've received as a result of the, the first three of these sessions. There's lots more to go, um, but I'm always fine tuning them. And um, it's really important for me to understand as a business, but also as an instructor, how to make them better. So have you gotten value and what, um, what specifically has been most valuable to you? And what is, yeah, what specifically has been most valuable to you? Um, and then the second question. So the first one's part one, kind of a two part question. The second question that I've got is what problem what problem in your mind does permaculture solve um, that is unique? So was there a problem that has been solved in your head or is starting, you're starting to see some resolution about it that you've been racking your brain about for years that um, you feel like you're starting to get some clarity on as a result of these programs? So I'll just say them again, just so that you've got some clarity on the questions that I've asked. So. Have you found value in the program? Yes or no? The second part of that is if you have had value, where has that value been? What has been most valuable to you? And the last question is, is what problem in your mind has permaculture helped solve for you as a result of the first three sessions that we've been talking about this introduction to permaculture? So you can leave that in the uh, comment section, or you can send me a personalized email as well. Either way, is it would be great. Okay, awesome, guys. Thanks so much. Let's keep going. So I wanted to go live on YouTube because I feel like there's just not a lot of uh, representation about some of the kind of basic components of permaculture. I've been at this for a decade now. I've thought a lot about it. I have a lot more thinking to do. Uh, and so I wanted to see how many people on YouTube would be interested in learning about what permaculture is all about. And it's been amazing to see how many people have come out, um, not just in the live sessions, but also to see how many people are actually watching these sessions after they go back up onto YouTube. Um, so that's been really great. Uh, one of the things that I've found with permaculture when I got into it was that there was no real great way to try before you buy, essentially. And so this was the attempt uh, at this course was to give people the opportunity to uh, dip their toe into the permaculture pool, if you will, uh, before jumping in entirely. So hopefully that's serving that. And I'd love to know if that's helping you guys to get a better understanding of what this is all about. Okay, so last week we talked about integration and design. Um, and this is actually going back a couple of weeks now. Each element performs many functions. Every element is supported by many others. We did a needs and yields analysis. I think that was in session number two. We did a needs and yields case study. And we talked about water being the master element. And then we also kind of, within that concept of water, we talked about water not being a waste resource, even though it's mostly dealt as a waste resource right now. And then we have to find unique ways to turn water into an opportunity or wastewater into an opportunity. And if you've been following David Holmgren, who's one of the kind of founders of permaculture, one of the co-inventors, if you will, he's just released a new book and he's got some really interesting insights around water and the suburban uh, landscape. And uh, um, I highly recommend checking out, he's got a couple of talks up on YouTube right now. They're about uh, 45 minutes to an hour long and he talks about his new book. And one of them specifically talks about how on farmland, the limiting factor is never sun. There's always enough sun on farmland. 
Um, whereas on farmland, typically the limiting factor is water. However, when we get into the suburban environment or the urban environment, uh, sun is almost always a limiting factor. At least, at least I've noticed that over the years. Whereas water is not a limiting factor. There's more water that's harvested on hard surfaces, roofs, sidewalks, roads, um, driveways. There's more water than we can put to productive use. It's just that we don't have the, the um, knowledge. I think we have the, we actually do have the knowledge, but we just have chosen not to um, deploy it, I guess. And so water is actually not a limiting factor in a city. Sun actually is. And so David Holmgren makes the argument that we need to actually retrofit the, the suburbs. Um, that's actually going to be the permaculture village of the future. We can grow most of our own food. We can um, supply most of our water needs. Most of the nutrient is wrapped up in these areas. It's a very, very interesting concept. Um, and it, it's very much steeped in what we've been talking about in this session and in the last. All right, so um, today we're gonna talk about uh, rain systems um, and various other water harvesting features, which is why I said there's gonna be lots of um, uh, need for resources, essentially. There's gonna be lots of stuff that you guys are gonna to wanna to look into as a result of tonight's talk, I guarantee it. Luckily for you, I've been producing videos like a Banshee on YouTube and there's a ton of resources up there. And so a lot of the stuff that we're gonna cover in a small amount of detail tonight is either gonna be able to be found on my blog um, or in um, the YouTube videos. Uh, before we get into the content here, I just wanted to share one more thing with you guys because I think it's important. I got an email from one of you guys um, and the email basically said, how can we find out what you're gonna be talking about live on YouTube? So um, hopefully you can see this right now. Yep. Um, so on my website, vergepermaculture.ca forward slash video, um, every week I update this, and I think my date might be wrong on here actually, but every week I update this little session uh, section right here of the website, and it will tell you exactly what I'm going to be covering live uh, during that week. So I'll, I'll be updating this here shortly for next week. Um, and I'll put out next week's shows that you guys can pay attention to. Generally speaking, we go live on YouTube three times a week. If you're wondering what we're going to be covering uh, for that week, come over here and check it out. You'll also see our latest videos. Um, just uh, FYI, we're gonna, I'm going to be talking about this one here shortly. It's a one minute video. Highly recommend you watch it. It'll be important for tonight. Um, there's lots and lots of content up here. Um, so go over to our website and check that out. Um, if you are considering taking the larger permaculture design program, because this is starting to resonate with you, you can also check out our PDC page, vergepermaculture.ca forward slash PDC. Um, so I can share those links a little bit later if you guys want them. You'll also notice that when you get here, you'll also find there's a free e-course, um, get our scoop on creating self-sufficiency. Um, so if you just click there, you can actually register for a free e-course on our website as well. Okay, folks, let's uh, let's get into the primary content for this evening. All right, so I wanted to thank you guys. Um, this one was Deborah Brown who sent it in. Wonderful, wonderful line drawing of her property. And you can see that Deborah's taken a long time to think about all the different water sources, where they're coming from, where they're going to, and this is gonna be very important. And I might refer back to this a little later this evening during the Q&A session, uh, because once you know where the water flows are coming off your property, you know which water harvesting features might fit. Um, she's also, I think, attempted to put in some contour lines right here. We've got downspouts, um, we've got the driveway, just an amazing job. So Deborah, if you're listening tonight, I just highly, um, I thank you for putting in all this effort. It gives a great example of uh, what's possible. Um, this is the simple stuff that people don't do that makes all the difference in the way that your ecosystem functions. And a functioning ecosystem is a resilient ecosystem, which is the whole goal of what we do this for. So thank you, Deborah. That was fantastic. Um, Frankie also has been an incredible uh, participant in the course. She comes to all the programs. So thank you, Frankie. Sounds like you guys are dealing with some flooding right now. So Frankie did some work trying to understand rainwater harvesting systems. Um, and so we will be talking about rainwater harvesting systems tonight. 
Um, so there's a couple of interesting resources here that Frankie's put together. It's wonderful. Thank you, Frankie, for doing that. Um, lots of interesting stuff here. So um, awesome for uh, taking the time to, to send me those resources. Thanks, guys. So that one minute video I was talking about specifically speaks to this uh, concept. So the importance of process. So process is more important than outcome. When the outcome drives the process, we'll only ever go to where we've already been. If the process drives the outcome, we may not know where we're going, but we'll know that we want to be there. And so this is, this is really important. This drives most of what um, my work has turned into. And, and one of the things that permaculture has done for me is it's really provided me with a foundational process to, to work through. And so it's when you look at present day design of properties, farms, ranches, acreages, most of us buy these properties with a predetermined idea of what needs to be there. So we kind of start with the endpoint and then we force function those components onto that property. And we end up paying the price in pollution. We pay the price in energy. We pay the price in work. Um, and most of the time we pay the price in ecosystem services. So we end up fighting against those ecosystem services or ecosystem processes. Whereas if we step back a little bit and we try and understand what we're surrounded by, um, the types of things that we're working within, how ecosystems function, what the geography and geology has to tell us, what the climate has to tell us, um, we can find opportunities. We won't necessarily know what those opportunities are when we go into it, but we'll know how to respond to them and how to work with them as opposed to against them as a result of following a process. So we don't know where we're going, but we'll know that it's right when we get there if we follow a process. And that's what I'm trying to teach you guys through this concept of an introduction to permaculture. So hopefully you're getting a sense of that. Um, it's taken a long time to kind of come to these conclusions. A lot of them are Bill Mollison's conclusions, but sometimes the way that we frame them is a little different. And that's a result of um, just a lot of thinking and practice over many, many years. And so what I'll say is that if you do end up going and taking a permaculture design course, it's a wonderful place to start. It's a horrible place to end. Um, permaculture is like Kung Fu in a way, or, or Tai Chi is a better analogy. Um, and it's a lifelong practice. You don't just start it and walk away and say, oh, I did that. Um, you have to go into it with um, intent and this concept of uh, practice and training. Um, and after a long time, things just start to click. Um, and there definitely will be things that click for you as a result of this program. Um, but um, the, those, those insights never stop. They, they, never, um, they never end. Uh, I think that that would be really sad if they did. And it's, you know, what keeps me in the game in permaculture is that there's never an end to the learning. Um, I am a voracious reader. I'm a voracious learner. And this system has kept me completely enthralled ever since I found it. Um, and so hopefully I've infected a few of you guys as well. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk rain tanks. Um, so the first resource that you're going to want to look up is I've got something like 20 things you need to know about rainwater harvesting systems on YouTube. So if uh, somebody could find that and just post it up into the chat window, that'd be great. Um, there's also a couple blogs on my website, vergepermaculture.ca. You can go and uh, find those as well. I think it's um, come on out, the rain is fine. If uh, somebody doesn't find it, just remind me at the end of the show and I can show that to you guys. There's a free infographic there that you can grab on everything you need to know about rainwater tanks. Um, so you can just download it from that page. Uh, so by, by all means, go and put that up into the chat window. <clears throat> um, Rain tanks are great. And um, I'm gonna talk about what's not great in this picture. This is a rain system that I have outside my front yard and it serves a purpose and it works okay. Um, and I did this because uh, I, I built an okay system because I was being bombarded with questions about using these uh, IBC tanks. So IBC stands for International um, Bulk Shipping Container. And they're about a thousand gallons or about 250, Sorry, sorry, a thousand liters and about 250 gallons. Um, and 
they're always used in urban rainwater harvesting scenarios. Now, number one, a thousand liters sounds like a lot of water, but it's not really that much water. Uh, the roof that this uh, rain tank harvests off of collects roughly uh, 15 to 16,000 liters per year. So, you know, 15 times what this tank can, can take. Now, all that water doesn't come at once. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a 15,000 liter tank, but a two, three, 4,000 liter tank would be very beneficial. Number two, the tank itself is op uh, not opaque. It's actually a translucent. And so it actually creates an enormous opportunity for algal growth inside of it, which can cause some problems with pumps and other things. Um, so it's too small, it's transparent. Number three, it's not really a rain tank. It's just a, a vessel for holding bulk fluids. And so uh, it means you have to do a whole bunch of custom plumbing to it. And so by the time you do all that plumbing and you spend all that time, unless you can get these tanks for free, uh, you're probably cheaper to have just purchased the right size tank in the first place and not had to fiddle around with all these plumbing fittings. The last thing, and this tank's fine, but um, you don't, you want to make sure that if you do go out of your way to get one of these things that you don't get one that's toxic. Uh, so there are a lot of toxic materials that are shipped around in these containers. It's not just food products. And I have a friend who went out and got 30 of them. Some guy put it up on Kijiji and said, oh yeah, you can come pick them up for a few bucks. Um, he ended up giving to them for free. And then by the time he got these tanks home, he realized that they were all full of this toxic goo. And so then he had to pay a massive landfill fee in order to get rid of them, which cost him a lot of money <laughs> and a huge headache. So don't get caught up with buying stuff that's not fit for purpose. You might think you're saving money in the long run, but you'll probably, uh, and you might, um, there's definitely some very, very smart um, scavengers out there. And I, I actually recommend scavenging. Scavenging is a fantastic way to get things for an inexpensive, um, you know, for less money. However, sometimes you have to be careful that your scavenging or your desire to scavenge um, doesn't end up coming and biting you in the butt. So just think a little bit about that. Now, a couple of things to notice here on the picture that you're looking at. So number one, we've got this diversion valve up here. So when the rain system is on, aka in the growing system, uh, growing season, sorry, uh, the water will come down into this downspout through a rain head or um, a gutter filter. Um, this takes all the large debris out of the rain, and then it goes into a first flush diverter down here. And so this removes the first uh, of the rainfall, which is going to be the dirtiest, and diverts it away from the tank. Once this uh, pipe fills up, then water will subsequently move into this pipe down here and, uh, and then fill up the tank. And so uh, this system will actually harvest very, very clean water if it's set up properly and properly maintained. Um, and we've proven that. Um, the biggest challenge people have with rainwater harvesting systems is that they don't clean this first flush diverter. And if you don't do that, you can end up turning this pipe into a septic mess. Literally, it starts to go septic. So uh, we always say, if you're not the maintenance type of person, then don't put on a first flush diverter. Um, absolutely put on your, your rain head. Outside of the growing season, we flip this thing back over onto this side. And as a result of that, the water then moves down here. And I'm actually standing right in front of my food forest. It goes into an underground perforated flexible pipe we call Big O. You guys can look that up if you want. Or weeping tile is another word for it. Or French drain tile or pipe. Uh, and we lay that down on contour. And I've got both videos and blogs on this on my YouTube channel called Urban Swales or How to Build an Urban Swale. There's a three-part series. I have a whole playlist on my YouTube channel, uh, all on swales, both urban and rural. So you'll want to check that out. And it shows how to build them. And so the water then goes into that swale all winter long and it sub irrigates the food forest. And the pipe itself is built into a, basically a level ditch. And then we in, um, embed it with, with wood mulch. And that wood mulch receives that water, it absorbs it, it becomes a sponge, it becomes a living, <laughs> fungal mass. Um, and so it creates water storage, it creates fungal habitat, which is what the food forest wants. And it also creates a place for us to send surplus water without getting rid of it off of our property. Now we pretty much, except for one small space on my yard, uh, absorb all the water that falls on our property. 
Now, if everybody in the city did that, there would be no stormwater issues, or very few anyways. We'd only have to deal with roads, but there's all sorts of other ways that we can manage road water runoff, which we're gonna talk about tonight. So that's the very basis basics of rainwater harvesting. I'll let you check out the 20 things you need to know about rainwater harvesting in that YouTube video. Um, if somebody could post that up in the chat window, that'd be wonderful, I'd really appreciate it. Um, and so here's just a couple of other pictures of rain tanks. Um, there's that same tank from the roof. And, and so you're wondering probably why I chose to use this crummy tank. I wanted to try it for myself. I wanted to see how bad it actually got. And so this is me trialing out these IBC tanks. And I can say that after doing it for a number of years, just go straight to an opaque tank that you get that's designed for purpose for rainwater harvesting. Don't mess around with these tanks. It's not really worth it. Um, so the swale runs along here. There's the path right there. There's the, the rain head. The first flush diverter sits right underneath. There's the diverter. This is a tank that we saw in Australia. Um, you'll notice that it's up on a stand. Water is really heavy. So if you're gonna do this, make sure you properly reinforce and, and design this whole system out so you don't end up creating a massive liability on your property. Um, and I'm gonna ask you guys a question. Why would you want to put your rain tank up on stilts? Why would you wanna put it up higher? Um, question for the group. Okay, so rain tanks, um, we got the, the, uh, the leaf feeder right here, the gutter filter. Um, and then there's just another shot of the, the rain system, um, just in case you wanted to see it from a different angle. Absolutely, let, let gravity do the work, totally, that's the answer. Okay, so here's the anatomy of a rainwater harvesting system. I've got a lot more detail on that infographic if you can find the infographic on my website. Um, but basically every rainwater harvesting system should have all of these components, or at least most of them. So we've got our gutter, We've got our diverter valve. And so this diverter can either go into the leaf feeder or it can go down into um, a swale or a rain garden. Um, we've got the first flush diverter right here. Um, we've got the inlet into the tank. You'll notice that when the water comes into the tank that we have these little upturns. And this is really important because the reason we put these upturns in is so that we can de-energize the water as it comes into the tank. Now, the reason for this is we don't want to upset the sludge. Now, Dr. Peter Coombs from Australia did this amazing research with one of his, PhD, in fact, it was one of his PhD students that did the research. He just supported him. Anthony Spinks was his name. Um, and what they found was that lead bioaccumulated in this sludge by up to 340,000 times. 340,000 times. Not only that, but they found that biofilms, which are the same microbes or similar microbes that grow on your teeth that make your teeth slimy at night were growing on the inner surface of these tanks and they found similar not quite to the same extent magnifications of things like cadmium um, and I'm trying to remember arsenic I think was another one I have to look at the report but all sorts of heavy metals that were bioaccumulating in these bioaccumulating in these microbes and so as a result of the research they basically said don't bother cleaning your rain tanks out anymore these living organ, these, these tanks are living organisms. They have their own ecosystems inside of them. Trust nature, basically, um, and let the sludge and the biofilms do their work and clean up the rainwater. And so it turns out that in two, three, four weeks after a rain event, the water gets really clean. It gets quite a bit cleaner than it was before. And that's a result of flocculation, active sludge on the bottom and biofilms on the walls. Uh, really, really interesting research, and it changes some of the directives around whether or not you should or shouldn't clean um, the rain tank. So we want to have a large enough volume, we want to make sure that water coming in is not going to disturb things, and that we've got proper biofilm um, starting to accumulate on the walls, which all comes down to the stuff that we've, we've spoken about previously in those, the other video, but also um, with some of the stuff that we've got set up here. Um, so first flush diverter, we've got the winter diversion we've talked about, the sediment layer we just spoke about, solid foundation underneath the tank. Water is very heavy. We want to make sure we properly support this tank. A quiet inlet, a quiet outlet. So we also want to make sure our outlet's not going to draw the water at the bottom of the tank. It's going to draw from a higher portion of the water column. We want to have a skimming overflow. So the top surface of the rain tank can also have water quality that's not ideal. And so having an overflow uh, 
on a 45 degree angle um, will help to skim any debris off the top surface. We want to make sure we have a, a mosquito uh, cap right here. So if this, this thing kind of will, can open up if it needs to, or it can stay closed, depends on the flow of the water, but we don't want vermin or mosquitoes being able to get in there. Um, you'll also notice that the first flush diverter has a small little hose right here, which goes also into here. So after a rain event, this first flush diverter will dr drip down. It's got a very small orifice in the bottom there um, and reset for the next rain event. That's how first flush diverters work. Um, and then we've got this weeping tile, which then feeds into this little garden over here on the right. So if you find this interesting, again, I sound like a broken record, go check out the YouTube video. We did a whole hour on just rain tanks, um, 20 things you need to know about rainwater harvesting systems. So I, I have a question for you guys. And while you're answering that question, I'm going to go find some of these resources for you so that you can go check them out later. Um, what percentage of a tree is water? What percentage of a tree is water? So I'll let you contemplate that while I'm going to get some resources for you. Sixty percent, seventy percent. Okay, keep guessing. Okay, so it, it varies um, between sixty and seventy percent. It's going to depend on the species. I mean, desert species might have less water in there. Um, it could probably even be higher for some wetland species as well. And so my question, next question to you guys is, are you looking at a forest? Or are you looking at an actively managed biological lake? So basically a lake standing on its head. So imagine the tonnage in that forest, like how much all those trees weigh. And if 60 to 80% of those trees are water, is it actually a bunch of trees or is it actually a lake? That's what I want you to contemplate. <laughs> Yvonne says, if you water them with whiskey, they come up half cut. <laughs> I'm going to use that one. Awesome joke. Um, anyways, so trees are water harvesting elements. We don't think of them that way, but the ultimate goal with permaculture is not to go and put water harvesting elements everywhere. The ultimate goal of permaculture is to get functional ecosystems back onto the ground, which we have removed over the years, over the last 12,000 years, um, because these ecosystems store biological water. They are managing the climate. They're managing soil fertility. They're managing the water cycle. They're managing the oxygen and the CO2 cycle. Um, we can't live on this planet without these ecosystems. So the water harvesting elements that we're going to talk about are basically ways of fast tracking forest ecosystems. Now, when I use the word forest ecosystem, the uh, I don't I don't want you to think that I'm actually completely biased towards forests. I don't differentiate forests from native prairies. Okay, the architecture or the, I should say the pattern between a native prairie and a fully functional forest like this one is the same. The pattern is the same. The scale is different, okay? And so native prairies were grasslands and they have emerged as grasslands because there wasn't enough water to get forest ecosystems to function. And grasslands are some of the most effective carbon sequestration mechanisms we have on the planet, which is why where I'm from, we have topsoils as deep as 20 feet, or at least we did 100 and 150 years ago before we started plowing them and growing annual crops. Um, and so grasses can be really effective ecosystems as well. So we want to always go back to what nature wants to be. We always have to ask that question, what does nature want to be? 
And then why is she not able to get back to that place? And then we try and understand what the limiting factors are, what the resource constraints are within that ecosystem. And nine times out of 10, unless you live in a really wet climate, the resource constraint is gonna be water. Um, so that's why we always talk about water access and structures. And we fix the water cycle, or at least create some opportunities, some bumps or speed bumps to slow water down. Then we can kickstart ecosystems. And once the ecosystem gets kickstarted, like a forest like this, is going to have low evaporation. And as that evaporation reduces, it creates more opportunities for life. It creates more snow harvesting. It creates no, more rain harvesting, creates more habitat. The whole system starts to spiral up. A lot of what we do in conventional agriculture does the exact opposite and it spirals down. So uh, that's why we are um, talking about water harvesting tonight. So swales are ditches on contour that intercept the flow of water. They can be integrated into farms and acreages uh, and specific characteristics can be part of an overall regeneration and drought proofing strategy. So forests are water harvesting um, and climate monitoring elements and swales are water harvesting elements that fast track forests. So this is actually Dakota Cohen's farm, um, amazing property. If you live in Alberta, he has a free farm tour every year, highly recommend going to it. They always sell out, they're free. Uh, if they're not free, they're very cheap. I think he charges 10 bucks. So you show up and then he gives you your money back or something. Um, but you should probably just leave the $10 with him. It's worth the three hours that he spends with you going around the, uh, the property. And um, uh, he's got massive, massive swales and has proven that they are highly effective in the cold climate. And he's got a couple of YouTube videos up you can check out uh, that go through um, what swales do in terms of removing frost from the ground early water harvesting i think last year he harvested 40 years of rainwater in one in the in his melt event so um we keep joking that at some point here his well the well on his property is pretty moderate like i think he gets one or two gpm um which is pretty low for a well especially when you're trying to keep a whole herd of cattle and um, pigs alive. Now he's got a lot of ponds and dugouts on his property, which is where most of the water for those animals come from. Um, but we keep wondering how long it's going to take for all this water that he's pushing down into the ground to start showing up in his well bore so that all of a sudden he gets three, four, five, 10, 20 GPM. Um, it's going to happen. It's inevitable. It's just a matter of what the lag time is in between when you set these water harvesting elements up and when they start to recharge groundwater aquifers. Um, his farm is more productive now um, than it's been in many years. Um, they're still on a, a regenerative path. His, his family is a very progressive family. They've been organic for 30 some years. He's a fourth generation farmer, um, um, but still kind of adopting these permaculture principles into what they do. And um, anyways, uh, uh, Dakota Cohen, uh, Seek to Find, was the name of the individual. And you can find him at grassrootsfamilyfarm.ca. Um, so here's a couple of examples of those same swales in winter. Um, they're picking up groundwater melt. And so there's a huge debate right now on the internet about whether or not uh, swales are good or bad. A lot of people uh, within the permaculture realm love to bash swales. And I just want to make a couple comments about that, because if you find somebody bashing swales, um, I'm not going to tell you that swales are good or bad. Um, Bashing swales would be like a carpenter telling you that hammers suck. A carpenter would never tell you that a hammer sucks. However, a carpenter would tell you that a, that a hammer sucks for putting in a screw. Um, a hammer is great for putting in a nail or for pulling a nail out, but it's not good for putting in a screw. And so within the realm of permaculture, we have this huge toolbox that we can gain access to. We've got, uh, especially in the water harvesting realm, we've got swales, we've got rain gardens, we've got um, media lunas, we've got all these different mechanisms that we can put to productive use in order to, again, get ecosystems off the ground. When somebody says one water harvesting element is good and one har water harvesting element is bad, um, in my opinion anyways, and um, so take this with a grain of salt, um, there's just not enough diagnosis. So another way to think about this is if, if you um, tore a ligament in your knee and you went to the doctor and you told the doctor 
um, you know, I tore my ACL and I want you to do surgery on me as soon as possible. Like it has to happen. What would the doctor say to you? He would look at like, look at you like you're crazy. He's like, well, no, I'm not going to put you under the knife because you think you've got some sort of issue with your ACL. He's like, I'm going to diagnose it. I'm going to go through my process. I'm going to do my due diligence. I'm going to x-ray you. I'm going to put you under an MRI. I might put a scope in there and see what's going on. And after that, we'll assess all of the options. And then we will address those uh, opportunities based on what we find through our diagnosis. And so I think, and this is what we do in our consulting pr practice, we have a company called Adaptive Habitat that some of the most valuable work that you can do as a designer, whether it's for yourself or for somebody else, is doing an appropriate diagnosis, really asking a lot of questions, understanding what the limiting factor is in this ecosystem. Why is this ecosystem stalling? What's stopping it? And you ask a thousand questions. And after you've asked those thousand questions, you'll start to get a little bit of a picture of what's going on. And instead of coming out and saying, swales suck, and we have to use key line or some some crazy thing like that, you'll look at the problem through that lens of diagnosis and say, well, based on the slope and the soils and the climatic conditions and whether it's cold or hot or dry, um, what type of farming is going on, what the goals of the person using the property are, what kind of equipment they're using. When you take all of that into account, then you can get a sense of what water harvesting element might make sense. Now, the converse of this is that people can go and take this course, this, these permaculture design courses, and leave and decide that they're going to put swales everywhere. So some people just talk about swales as though they're gospel. They're just a water harvesting element. They're just a speed bump in the landscape that are designed on contour to slow water down. And you have a whole toolbox full of them. So when you're thinking about these water harvesting elements, as we go through this, think about the fact that you've got this toolbox and um, uh, try and understand the base principles of what each of the water harvesting elements are trying to do and then compare it to the diagnosis that, you're, um, that you've done for your property or for your client's property and only then will you get a sense of whether or not this is going to be a fit. So it's really easy to react and just say this is good, this is bad. There is no good or bad, there's just appropriate um, and, and context specific. So try and understand the context with which you are um, working in. Uh, this is just another picture of Dakota's farm. So you can really get a sense of what he's doing. Um, he's got this massive swale right here down there. This is his, I think it's a 3 million liter or 3 million gallon dugout. I can't remember the numbers. They're um, hard to remember this massive um, stream that just kind of flows through this property here. Um, actually, I think it comes through this drainage right here. And this all gets absorbed all through here. This is a, a dead or dying lake. Um, and, uh, and so all this water, this is his 40 years of catchment. I think he took this last year with my drone. Um, and so, yeah, pretty amazing property. It's 160 acres. Um, they, they do a combination of uh, multi-cultural uh, uh, grains and, and legumes down here, bar barley and pea with a couple of other uh, biodiverse covers. They've got a ton of grazing land up here and they've got two other quarters that they have access to for grazing their cows, beef, chickens, um, and pigs. And so if you're ever looking for some of the best meat in Alberta, I highly recommend checking out Grassroots Family Farms. Um, they do amazing stuff. Just had one of their pork chops tonight. It was unbelievable. So we talked a little bit about these urban swales. This is usually what we connect uh, to our food forest or to our gardens. These are weeping tiles right here. Um, this weeping tile has got a funny story. Uh, it's actually coming from my neighbor's roof. I love harvesting water so much. Um, and I knew that my neighbor was a uh, Budweiser and hockey fan. So one night when he was watching hockey, I brought over a case of Budweiser and said, Hey, Gord, do you mind if I uh, connect your downspout into my food forest for a case of Budweiser? And uh, he said, done, totally. And so I just connected this weeping tile in onto his roof. So I get another 15,000 liters of water onto this side of my food forest. I get 15,000 on the other side. You can see it from, um, there's a documentary that we did, um, a three-part series on our urban permaculture uh, homestead. 
and we've got a bunch of details on how that all works. Um, so this moves into the pipe and then infiltrates uh, into the ground. Those are the mulch pathways. There's Michelle and the kids. Um, we have another mulch pathway in our backyard, same sort of system. When this system overflows, it overflows down into the bottom system right there. Um, and so typically this would be the overflow from a roof or from a rain tank going down in here. So no drop of water ever leaves the, um, the property. It goes into the, these mulched pathways, which by the way, are really comfortable for walking on. We love them. They're amazing. I just specified one for another client in Ontario just, re just yesterday, actually. Um, so there I am digging it out. We've got um, this path that's level on the bottom. It creates these raised beds in the middle. These raised beds, it's really important to remember to make your raised beds uh, double arm reach. And so what that means is that uh, the beds should always be uh, just big enough for the person with the smallest arm. Okay, so that's Michelle and my family. So the beds are designed to be either single or double arm reach so that nobody has to stand on the garden bed. Then we lay the weeping tile into the trench, we fill it back up with mulch, and then we plant out the garden bed. And it's honestly been one of the best gardens that we've ever um, operated. I mean, it's right outside our backyard, so we put a lot of love and attention into it, but um, this facilitates very easy uh, irrigation. It's all passive. When the rain comes, the garden gets whatever rain falls on it, plus it gets whatever surplus water we're not harvesting in rain tanks and collects into the ground. Here's another project. This was in Canmore. So this is about an hour uh, west of where we are. And so they're putting in a, a similar system into their community garden. Um, and again, it turned out really, really well. So you get a sense, you've got these raised beds, we've got these mulched pathways. Um, the mulched pathways are there for water harvesting. So they typically have a pipe in them. Um, then they get cover cropped and planted. And then you these beautiful, super productive gardens that nobody ever has to walk on. They have deep mulch, they're not rototilled, um, and they have subsurface irrigation. And you can always do overhead irrigation too if you need to add a little bit of extra water anywhere uh, into the future. So remember, work is a failure in design. And, and when we spend a little bit more effort on the design side of things and the thinking side of things, we end up um, saving ourselves forevermore. It's just, we, we, we focus on process and systems. And if we get those pro the process and the systems right, then those other pieces just fall into place. So in summary, rain tanks, um, in this uh, session, we talked about rain tanks. We talked about the anatomy of a rainwater harvesting system. We talked about a forest as an actively managed lake. Uh, we talked about broad acre swales and Dakota Cohen's farm. And we talked about um, urban zone one, zone two swales. Now I haven't talked a lot about zones yet, so we'll hit that in a future session here. Um, but basically just to quickly, um, now that you're wondering what zones are, zones are basically uh, uh, zones of energy efficiency essentially. So we place everything on our property relative to how often we use it. And so we're gonna talk a lot about zones in a future session and how to delineate it out on your property so that again, like your herbs that you use uh, for your omelet on Sunday morning should be available to you via slipper. Uh, you should be able to go out into your back garden and your slippers, get whatever herbs you need and bring them back in for your omelet on Sunday morning. Um, so we're gonna talk about the importance of energy efficiency and there's so much more to go on this program. I've got a whole bunch more water harvesting features that we're gonna talk about next week. Um, and so I wanna uh, move towards uh, Q and A. Next week, we're gonna talk about curb cuts, wicking beds, and constructed wetlands, and where they play an important role in the design and water harvesting features of a, a functional permaculture system. Again, there are a lot more water harvesting features than just the ones that we're gonna talk about. Um, there's some great resources out there. Namely, um, you can check out our YouTube channel. We've got a lot of um, uh, videos on water harvesting, more coming all the time. Um, so make sure you tune in next week for our continued water harvesting uh, program. Um, where to get more information? So the show notes. So I'll make sure that I uh, put some show notes below with some of the specific content we talked about tonight. Um, our mailing list, I write a weekly-ish email. Um, so if you haven't signed up for that, you get a free copy of our blog book, which is our best blogs in a magazine style um, uh, ebook, essentially. 
Um, we've got some free e-courses, which I showed you guys at the beginning of the evening. If you guys are more interested in that, I can talk about that tonight. If you put some, uh, ask me about it. Uh, we are offering three permaculture design courses this year. I'd love to see some of you guys in it. Um, it's an amazing course. It's life-changing to say the least. Um, you can see some of the reviews of our students on our website. We do a, a, a monthly uh, feature of our past students and what they're using permaculture for. Um, it's been a very popular series. There's also a new series we started about how permaculture changed my life and not my life, but my students' lives. Um, we've got online training, the Permaculture Pro webinar series. So if you're starting to implement some of these ideas and need a little bit more support, um, that's going to be a tailored uh, support program. So you can come in and ask questions and make sure that they get answered. Um, it's going to be a great program, much more um, specifically tailored to a small gr smaller group of people. Um, and then there's always consulting. And so we consult right across the country. We have uh, phone consulting hours on Fridays and Wednesdays. It's all on our website on adaptivehabitat.ca. You can put that website up there. Um, and you can find more information about our consulting at Verge Permaculture as well. There's a whole section on our consulting there. Okay, guys. So um, just lastly, if you want to support this course, you can do so by hitting the like button down below. Please, please, please hit the like button. It helps me so much. It helps the, the channel track. So if you haven't done, that's great. Um, you can share this on social media. You can share any of our videos on so social media. I would love that. I'd be so grateful to you guys. It really helps my channel track. Um, we're really trying to create a large reach. Um, you can leave your comments below in any of our videos. And if you got some value from this presentation, I'd be really appreciative if you donated. Um, all that information is in the show notes below as well. Um, and I'm going to open it up to Q&A for you guys. So let's, uh, let's take some questions. If you guys have any questions, also while we're waiting for the questions to come in again, the questions that I had for you is how many of you guys got value, have, have had value from this program? I'd lo love to hear. There's a bunch of you guys on the program right now. If this is valuable to you, again, you can hit the like button. And leave me a comment or send me an email, please. I'd love to hear from you. And if it has been valuable, I want to know what the biggest insight has been for you. Um, and lastly, I want to know what problem in your mind, permaculture, like the biggest problem that this has solved in your own mind. Has it reduced some fear of the gl global fragility? Has it created hope? Um, do you feel less lonely? What is it that this course is solving for you? I really want to know the answer to that question. And I'm just waiting for you guys to be able to um, uh, put some questions up there. I'd love to uh, answer any questions that we had tonight about swales, about urban swales, um, about water harvesting in general. Um, please, by all means, um, Put them up in the comment section. I'm here for another, I can be here for another 30 minutes if we need to. Um, I can answer anything about permaculture. It doesn't even have to be about tonight's content. You can just post anything up there at all. Okay, so just waiting for some Q&A, guys. Uh, I'm going to pull a few more uh, resources up here for you guys. Just pulling up a blog with the infographic. So if you guys want to check that out, you can go over there and check it out on the Verge Permaculture site. Okay, so Yvonne, um, like has been hit. Do you just keep uh, filling mulch swales as they degrade? Yes, Yvonne, that's exactly what we do. So as the mulch decomposes every two years about, I find that I have to bring in one or two yards onto my yard. 
Um, the trick is to make sure that you're bringing in mulch that's non-allopathic. So in our ecosystem, that means cedar. You'll have to do your research on your ecosystem in terms of what is and is not allopathic. Um, and that just creates a new bed because it's got that plastic pipe inside. It maintains a channel for the water to flow forevermore. Can local water harvesting project against uh, can can local water harvesting protect against flooding or only drought? Absolutely, and and like the thing is, is that the aggregate of water harvesting projects on a property can protect against both of those things. Um, if we, uh, as a city, harvested the water that fell on our properties and didn't constantly just shed it away, uh, it would totally change all of the infrastructure in the city. Um, and proper water management on your own property can protect your foundation. I mean, it's crazy. When I do a consultancy um, in my bioregion, I always save the value or, or give the value back to the client that they've paid me in the first 15 minutes because almost everybody um, that I go and visit does not properly manage the rainwater. Um, they just dispose of it right beside their foundation, which can create huge hydraulic pressures and cause cracking of the foundation. So if you're not pushing the rainwater away from your foundation, you need to do that. That's the first thing. And then the second thing, hopefully, is to change how your landscape is constructed so that you're holding some of it back in tanks, letting the surplus, using the surplus as a resource and feeding a food forest or a garden, and really just managing that rainwater as a resource and stop looking at it as a liability. Great question. Great work you have done. Thanks so much. Jan, uh, Jan Designs, what is your experience with using swales on broad acre on the west coast of BC? Our wet winters can create some challenges of oversaturation. Yeah, I mean, you guys work out on the west coast and you guys have, um, I think it's, it's Jamie, right? Um, you guys probably have a lot more context specific experience with swales than, than we do. Um, and so what I will say with the west coast is that, um, you have oversaturation issues in the wintertime and then you've got the exact opposite problem in the summertime because you guys are in a Mediterranean climate. And so the challenge is always to figure out how to work with, work with the elements within the ecosystem that will move resources from one season into another. And I think this is one of the main reasons that, like I, I was on Quadra not that long ago, uh, you know, that ecosystem really wants to be trees. It, it, it just wants to grow trees. Trees, when we move over a certain rainfall amount, one of the reasons that ecosystems want to be trees is that when you get a lot of rainfall, rain is the um, ultimate um, so, uh, uh, solvent. And so um, one of the limiting factors on every ecosystem before humans came along and invented um, uh, superphosphate and um, uh, nitrogen fertilizers and um, water soluble potassium fertilizers, a nutrient is a limiting factor. And so if you're an ecosystem and you know that nutrient is a limiting factor and you live and you're in an ecosystem, these or the, uh, an ecosystem is trying to preserve its nutrients as long as possible, you're going to hold a lot of those nutrients in the canopy. And so that's why when you get over about 15 inches or about 400 to 450 millimeters of rain per year, you're going to predominantly see forest ecologies. And so in the prairies, we're always trying to figure out how to get trees to grow. Um, when really, you know, especially where I live in southern Alberta, it's predominantly a grassland. It emerged that way because of the lack of rain. Uh, and then on the west coast, what I find is really interesting is that people on the west coast are always trying to create pasture. Um, we're always trying to get what we don't have, essentially, it's as opposed to looking at the ecosystem through a, uh, there's no such thing as a non-biased lens, um, but at least trying to be honest about what our biases are and trying to figure out what that ecosystem wants to be. Because ultimately, if we work with what the ecosystem wants to be, it's going to be much less energy and effort in the long run. Um, and so really trying to, instead of, understanding whether swales are right or wrong. It may be right in some places and wrong in others. Um, generally speaking though, if you have set the systems up properly and you're partnering with forest ecosystems, um, then you know you can pretty much get a tree to grow out there just by sticking it into the ground as long as you plant it in the right season. And so swales 
and or water harvesting might not really be the primary limiting factor for that ecosystem, depending on where you're working. It's really hard for me to say unless I have a specific context. Um, okay, so let's just go back to what's the next question. I was really afraid that planting fruit and nut trees above our surface well would deplete the water. Not so, if I understand you correctly. Mary, it depends on how deep your surface well is. Um, for you, you might actually benefit from some water harvesting higher up on your property to um, recharge the lens on top of there. Now, I, I know a lot, of, a lot of the trees around the top part of your property have been removed. If you look at your ecosystem in Quebec, that ecosystem wants to be trees. Um, and so the trees themselves, yes, they are going to pull water out of the ground, but they're also the hair on the back of the dog. So they're going to uh, store water in the ground for longer. They're actually going to reduce or, or um, slow down the melt of snow water um, by keeping the sun off of the snow. And so it may actually prolong the amount of time that you actually have groundwater. So it's not always as intuitive as, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive is basically what I'm trying to say. Sometimes these things have counterintuitive properties. I would say for you guys, it, depending on whether you've got bedrock or not, you know, putting a pond in somewhere is probably going to be a good option potentially. Um, but you have a lot of other water things that you need to think about. You may also want to look at large scale water harvesting and storage um, as a way of uh, reducing the demand on your toilets. The other thing that I'd recommend is uh, looking at um, some low tech gray water systems, not recycling gray water into toilets, um, but reducing the amount of water that you're using by irrigating around your property with gray water, and maybe even going to a bucket toilet. I mean, 20% of the water that we use just goes to flushing toilets. And this is the insanity of the Western world. I mean, we are so affluent that we use drinking water to flush away our, our excrement. It's unbelievable. Um, so I highly recommend if, if you're up for it, that you check out the Humanure Handbook. Um, it's a wonderful read, it's hilarious, but it's also very philosophical and poignant. And it, it really gets the point of how insane it is that we defecate into drinking water. Philip Brown, rewalkways. Do you just refresh the wood chips or do you periodically dig out and replace? I used to dig out and replace them. Um, now I just add more in because what I found is that the worms actually live in these pathways and they're doing all the work. They're digging it out and sending it out into the gardens. Our gardens have improved as a result of these beds, which was not anticipated. So now I just add them in because I'm lazy. Pensioner Pond Permaculture. Why do swales work well in cold climates? Well, again, they may or may not work for your context, but what we've observed is that uh, farms that, and, and larger properties, and actually properties in general that don't have these speed bumps. Now, typically these speed bumps, again, are just forests or functioning ecosystems. But what we found is that when a system essentially runs out of water, and which, which re results is a result of a lack of carbon in the soil, which is a result of improper grazing techniques, um, monoculture, um, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, when you basically degrade a system to a point where it won't come back on its own, or if it does, it'll take a really long time. What a swale can do is it can, uh, when we get our big melt, for example, in the uh, springtime, typically the surface snow on a farm or on a exposed property will melt faster than the ground will melt. So our ground will freeze solid to six feet down. And if you have ground frozen six feet down, then all that runoff, all that snow water will just leave your property. It won't infiltrate. But if you put a few speed bumps along the way, what can happen is that water will get held up in those swales. And as a result of that, let me just go back here, a couple images, this one here, what you can find on Dakota's farm here is that all this water, had he not put swales and ponds in, would just have ended up in this lake, which is fine. Like there's nothing wrong with it ending up in the lake. And ultimately it will still end up in that lake. It might just take 30 years to get there, which is actually what we want it to do. We want 
the groundwater cycle to have a 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 year time span so that water that falls on it today may not get to its final destination for 100 years. This is the primary reason that creeks, streams and rivers flow. And when we deplete all the groundwater reserves because of the way that we farm or that we build towns and cities, all of our creeks and rivers will run dry, just like they have done in places like Tucson, Arizona, where the climate is a little bit more brittle. So what we're doing here is we're reinvigorating the water cycle. And we've got this great saying, I think Darren Doherty came up with it, which is blue, green, and brown. So blue stands for water, fix the water cycle. That fixes the plant cycle. Once we fix the plant cycle, then we can start fixing the, the carbon cycle. Once the carbon cycle is fixed, a 1% increase in carbon will increase the amount of water stored per hectare by 166,000 liters, which is equivalent to, I think it's 17,000 gallons per acre. Okay, so that's our ultimate rainwater harvesting feature is the soil. The soil is where we store our water. But sometimes we have to give it a little bit of a help. It's a suture. It's a small element that in the scheme of things will mean nothing from the, you won't even see it. It'll just be a speed bump in the landscape. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of what swales do in the cold climate. Several of your videos uh, mention the tire marsh at the head of your swale. Yeah, so I have a small little tire pond on my property and rainwater flows off of my roof into a tire pond. And um, the tire pond basically de-energizes the water, it cleans it up a little bit, and then it overflows out of the tire pond into our upper swale there. Um, so Karen, so did you get page not found from our website then? Can you just elaborate a little bit on that? Thank you. Economically, what do you think is the most low hanging fruit to reach for the water harvesting and budget minded approach? Um, I mean, this is, I need more context to give you an answer, but uh, if you just mulch your garden, that's a rainwater harvesting feature, just putting mulch on your garden. And for your, your food garden, your vegetable garden, that can be straw on your food forest, that can be wood mulch. That's a water harvesting feature right there. Um, if you want, you can contour your land. You can put some of these garden swales in. Um, one thing to keep in mind with these garden swales that's really important is that if you're putting one in, you want to make sure that you don't start infiltrating water uh, any closer than 10 feet to your foundation. So the way that I do that is I put the pipes going into the swale on a slope, pretty steep slope going in. And then once I'm 10 feet away from my foundation, then I go flat. <clears throat> Hopefully that made sense. Mike B, my five acre lot have uh, has a V slope in the middle of it that channels all of our water. Would it be wise uh, to swale the two slopes or just plan the property to use one V channel? Again, Mike, I'd have to see the property, but uh, typically when you have a V channel, depending on how big it is, that could be a great place for a pond. Uh, that could be a great place for a pond and a swale. So when the pond overflows, it back floods out into the swales and hydrates the property to the side of it. Um, sometimes you can put a swale into the V channel and then drive water out onto your ridges, which is typically the first place that it's going to get dry. Um, and then once you've got the water out onto those ridges, you, ridges, you can then spread the water um, across the ridges to hydrate those. Generally, we want to dis, um, dispose is the wrong word, but we want to, when we have too much water, we want to get rid of the water on our ridges because they uh, pacify water as opposed to V channels, which will focus it and can cause um, soil erosion. Never done homestead. Our farmstead's barnyard currently under a lot of water and mud. Would love to figure out how to store it for later. Looking forward to next week for more ideas to add to my toolbox. So it's interesting, never done homestead. I cannot tell you how often people put buildings in the wrong place, unfortunately. And it might be the case for you, I'm not sure but um, people put roads in valleys and they put buildings in low spots and you will never recover from this. This is what we call a type one error in permaculture, which means that no matter how much energy or design you throw at it, the only solution to it is to move the, the building, move the road or start over again. Um, it's, I wrote a, I've written a number of blogs on this and one of the most valuable things that you can learn in a permaculture design course is how to avoid these type one errors. 
um, it makes the course actually seem really cheap because um, people, when you don't know what you don't know, you end up making decisions based on what you don't know, and you'll end up paying the price for that forevermore. Um, and so type one errors are what we call it. You'll want to do what um, was it Karen did this evening um, and map out your water flows based on your contours. And once you understand how the water's traversing across the property, then you can start to understand where the dry spots and the wet spots are. And then from there, so water access and structures, you understand where the water is coming from, where it's going to, and how to locate buildings on the property such that you're not going to end up with buildings that are in giant um, ponds. Hopefully that made sense. Doreen, this course is helping me believe there's hope for a future. Awesome, Doreen. Thank you so much. Frankie, Rob recommended a really good book called Rainwater Harvesting by Brad Lancaster at Never Done Homestead. Highly recommend that book. Uh, volume one and volume two are fantastic. Seek to find. How do you know what a piece, what piece of land, what you, how do you know what a piece of land would be best for you? Great question. Um, so if you think about buying property, you think about it from the perspective of um, essentially a, you want to think about it from the perspective of, let me just draw this here, a Venn diagram. And so when we look at a Venn diagram, if you've never seen one, this is a Venn diagram. We call this the sum of possibilities. Okay. And then inside here, we have budget. We have agroecology. And we have goals or quality of life statements. And so as a result of this, what we do when we help somebody to find a piece of property is we, let's see if I can get another, nope. Um, we try and help people to find this part right here, which is the sweet spot. And it's that sweet spot that uh, is most important. And so some people um, don't have predefined goals about what they want on a piece of property. So they don't really know what kind of animals or trees they wanna grow. Um, they just have a sense of what their quality of life want, has to be as a result of owning this property. And so that gives you a lot more options. Other people like myself know that the only thing that matters to them is they wanna raise pigs. Like that's the most important thing or one of them anyways. And so we start with our goals. And once we know what we're aiming for, and we've got a whole process that we use in Adaptive Habitat to help people define their goals. Then we look at what financial and other resources, not just budgetary, but we look at all of the resources available to you. Um, and then we look at, um, we basically go out and seek properties. So that's what I mean by agroecology that have specific characteristics, knowing that the only properties that are gonna fit are down here. And so this is why some of our clients tell us that one of the biggest services that we provide to them is that we take the sum of possibilities, which is basically the hyper complexity of buying, managing and designing land. And we essentially, our consulting services, basically, we should just call it Venn diagram permaculture, because all we do is we take, I mean, when we do a full design of a property, we look at engineering, we look at thermal dynamics, we look at biology, we look at budget, we look at goals, we look at agroecology, um, we look at land use bylaw, we look at climate, we look at geography, we look at all of these things independently, and then we try and understand what that little tiny spot is right in the middle, right here, um, and that's what results from a permaculture design. And this is why I think permaculture is absolutely incredible is because before I never had a context, I had an engineering context, but I didn't have a way of looking and diagnosing a problem and an opportunity as well in a way that I do now, because I can take all of these different Venn diagrams and bring them together. And what's really important to understand is that sometimes 
there's not going to be an intersection point. We call this the negative positive or the negative diagnosis, which basically means that you spent all this time or energy trying to figure out what the fit is and there's no fit. And sometimes, and most of the time actually, the negative diagnosis is actually very positive because it means you can move on with your life. Um, it may be not what you thought you were going to be doing or what you were looking for. Um, but if you don't do the work, then you'll never know. And that's where regret usually uh, pops its ugly head. Hopefully that made sense. Uh, Jan Designs, thanks for the answers. Mary Ellen, thank you. Frankie Robertson, holistic goals that seek to find, absolutely. Uh, Ryan Stitt, um, converting conventional farmland. Should I harvest water using swales in clay loam slope type? Live in Michigan zone five, uh, average rainfall. So I'm not sure what average rainfall means. I have been to Michigan. It might work there. Again, I need to have a little bit more context. Um, I know that in your neck of the woods, Mark Shepard's done some stuff with key line plowing. Um, it, <clears throat> the question you guys have to ask yourself about water harvesting is, is the water harvesting element that I'm looking to use going to address the resource constraint? So in other words, is water a resource constraint for you, Ryan? And if it's not, then you may not need to do anything. Um, if, if you've already got the water cycle sorted, you may just want to add in some shelter belts, or you might want to add in some, um, some other biology. Like sometimes you can get all the water harvesting that you need just by changing the grass species or just by changing the tree species. Um, there's so many different ways to go about this. Uh, it really is context specific. What are you trying to grow? What is your rainfall? What is your limit resource constraint? Um, it, are swales gonna actually address your week, your, your production week link? And if not, then what is your production week link? And let's not spend any money on changing things when we haven't identified what the weak link in, in the chain of production actually is. Christine, uh, Christine, thank you for spending this time instructing us. You're welcome, Christine. I hope that you've gotten lots of value out of it. Um, Never done homestead. Frankie Robertson, thanks. Karen, um, the link that you gave did not find a page. It's interesting. We've been having some issues with um, our website, so we're slowly working through it. Hopefully we get this sorted out uh, sooner rather than later. Um, Frankie, UW at Never Done Homestead, or you're welcome. Um, Ryan, currently corn and soy, but the goal would possibly silva pasture or whatever the land would like to go. So Ryan, I need to know a little bit more about your rainwater pattern. And uh, if you are gonna move to pasture, I guess my question would be, uh, if you were to plant trees out there right now without the use of irrigation, would they survive? And if the answer is yes, then you might not need to go to the trouble of putting in swales. Frankie, interesting. Do you have any horses, Ryan? Uh, Ryan, Frankie, Robertson, currently no livestock planning to transition the next five years, right? Yes, I am on avoiding these errors. Absolutely. Thank you, Ryan. Karen, out of focus. Oh, sorry about that. Hopefully it's back in focus again. Uh, Pensioner Pond Permaculture, thank you. Frankie, horses lead me to permaculture because I never want to board my horses. So, so then my quest for land unfolded. Seek to find, right on, love Venn diagrams, flow charts too, me too. Laura H, Frankie, me too. Frankie Robertson, yes, Laura H. Okay, lots of good content going on here. Uh, Karen, wow, can you design a retirement? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Laura, um, plus feeding the family good fruits and veggies without going completely broke. Frankie, thank you, Rob. Uh, Verge Permaculture is a highlight of my week take. Gives me hope, life, and definitely looking forward to the future. Awesome, thanks, Frankie. I'm learning it pays to call in the professionals when searching for land. It can do, for sure. Okay, guys, well, that's the end of the questions. Um, if there's anything else, you're welcome to post it up there before we go offline. Um, thank you so much. If you hit the like button, thanks for showing up. Uh, we don't have a live show planned on YouTube this Friday. Um, so check back on the Verge Permaculture website, uh, vergepermaculture.ca forward slash video, if you wanna find out what's coming up in the week ahead. Uh, apologies, apologies for the um, deep database error there and our, our uh, web page is not coming up. We have to get that sorted out. Uh, I hope to see you guys next Monday at 12 o'clock Mountain Standard Time here on YouTube. Uh, I do not know what we'll be talking about, but it'll be something interesting uh, to be determined. And then again, next Wednesday, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, Introduction to Permaculture, Part 5. 
So thank you again, guys, so much. I hope to see you guys here next week and hopefully in a future program as well. Okay. All the best, guys. We'll talk to you real soon.